So, thanks for having me. Um, I've got the very difficult task of keeping you all awake for that difficult three o'clock moment. I know in every every day it comes a lot, no matter how much coffee I drink, if I'm sitting in front of my desk, or even worse, in a dark room with somebody talking at me. <laughs> very hard to stay awake. So I'm going to do what I can to keep things lively um, with this talk. And it does, in a sense, follow from my article, which in a sense follows from another talk I gave in the Center of Latin American Studies about free sources. But um, when asked to do uh, a talk about Frida's part, uh, as it were, in um, the, the sort of Mexico City in the 20s through the 40s, this wonderful time of so much vitality and um, so much cultural connection, uh, so much politics and so much life and so much art, um, it, I thought, actually, you know, that sources bit wasn't so irrelevant. Um, because you know our historians play around with, oh yes, of course, this is a copy from this ancient sarcophagus, and Raphael switched it around, it's on the opposite side, but you can see he was looking at this thing. And you know, our historians like to play those games, and you know, usually for everybody else, boring. But um, <laughs> I've, uh, I've, I've found some you know, interesting material here, and I think that I can keep it a little bit lively. The, the fundamental thing is that um, you know, when you look at Frida's sources, when you look at the material she looked at, it not only tells you a lot about who she was as an artist, and I think that's pretty much what the article I, I tried to do, um, sort of where are all these different sources she's drawing from, but also um, it tells you a lot about the world she lived in and the way in which she chose to engage in that world. Um, when I was a grad st student here at Berkeley, um, Stephen Greenblatt, who was a very famous English professor, I remember going and sitting on the floor in the hallway for a long time to get into his office hours, and uh, he'd written this book called uh, Renaissance Self-Fashioning, which was all the rage at the time. Um, the new historicism and all of that. But the idea, really, um, and with a whole body picture on the cover with the two guys standing there looking so um, important and worldly, um, it was that the way in which one presents oneself has everything to do with who one is and how we perceive that person to be. Obviously, um, having a painting made of you is perhaps the best way to make that presentation permanent. Unless you make the painting yourself, in which case it's an even better way, right? Painting the world and painting yourself is a, an even more masterful way of controlling your destiny and making the presentation of your life permanent. Um, your self-presentation will always be out there. And for an artist like Frida Kahlo, who didn't paint hardly anything besides herself, <laughs> um, it becomes a very interesting issue, right? All the texts on Frida Kahlo deal with a number of issues, one of which is, you know, all of her pain. You know, it's impossible to deny. It's everywhere. It starts with polio, then she gets the terrible uh, streetcar accident, um, not to mention all the emotional pain, right? That she says there were two, you know, there are two major wrecks in my life. The first was the streetcar, the second was Diego. Um, <laughs> So, you know, there's, a, there's an incredible amount of material to, to dig into there. Um, and then everyone also talks about Frida and her image of self and the way in which she presents herself. Because no matter how many photographs you see of Frida, Frida, it always seems like she is presenting herself. Remember, she was the daughter of a photographer. She grew up learning how to pose and taking those skills forward allowed her to present herself in a historical way. But what you can learn from, I would suggest, is that she presented herself in a way that was historic for herself. Her art became historic. It came to stand in for many things that we understand about Mexico today. But it was historic in another sense, in that she was drawing from sources. She was drinking the water that everybody was you know, bathing in, as it were. And all of those um, real life experiences that she had is what she drew in and created art out of, right? So as I revisit, um, uh, to a certain degree, this idea of her sources, um, I'm very much looking to see what kind of world she lived in. And it's a world that is, of course, inflected by countless stories. Um, I just walked in and heard some good stories, and I'm sure that Will is going to give you a lot of good stories next. Um, and Frida, Frida was not the storyteller of the family. That was Diego. Um, but Frida did tell a number of stories herself. And Diego was just famous for talking. He 
get storytelling. It, it was something that was natural to him. In a sense, I think that Frida's stories can be read still in her images. Um, yes, there are many letters. Yes, there are a lot of interviews. And there's always new material that will continue to cause us to be interested in and fascinated by her story and her life. Um, and there are many movies uh, that have been done. But uh, I'm an art historian. Back to the art, right? So um, Frida uh, on the left uh, with her thorns, her crown of thorns is sort of worn <coughs> as a decoration, as a sort of necklace. Um, uh, an imitato Cristo, but you know, that changed to be a, a kind of um, badge of honor uh, and a decoration for her. Um, or her, uh, my nurse and I, where uh, she's drinking, she's seen drinking from the bosom of her wet nurse, whose head has been replaced by uh, an Olmec um, uh, sculpted head, um, as if she is, you know, taking in the nourishment of this ancient Mexican um, existence. Um, this is a sense of her idealization about herself. And it's, as you can see, right off the bat, incredibly mixed. Yes, we have the Catholic tradition, the crown of thorns, but we also have the hummingbirds, right? Um, the hummingbirds, which are actually flowers, which is a very a wonderful, creative um, reinterpretation of that. Um, uh, the dragonflies, I mean, there's the hummingbird hanging from her neck, an Aztec symbol. So we get the mixed religious symbolism right off the bat. Um, uh, this is, of course, uh, the monkey and the cat were supposed to be indicative of her two um, lovers at the time, uh, Diego and Nick Mara. I'll leave you to determine which one's which. Um, <laughs> and, the, um, and, you know, the, the other image of this sort of Mesoamerican um, uh, basis for Mexican identity. And of course, as we know, this is uh, Mexico that is just recovered from a revolution, or perhaps still recovering in a way from its revolution of 1910. The, the world that she grew up in, she identified so much with the revolution, she changed her birth date. Um, she was born in 1907, but she said she was born in 1910 because that's when uh, the revolution began. And of course, we're celebrating the 100th anniversary of that right now, so nothing more timely than this. In any case, we know Frida to be an artist who used many different sources and who mixed them up and who always personalized them. Um, she's considered to be incredibly unique and entirely innovative, and that's absolutely true. But as I tried to argue in my article, there are reasons to look at her sources. There are, there are currents that she's picking up on. She doesn't invent all of this stuff. And um, it's pretty interesting to get a grip on what that means for her as an artist is one thing, but for her as, a, as part of history, part of a history that's unfolding. Yes, she's a teller of history, but she lives in history. Oh, I'm so ready to install that update. Okay. Um, next. So here's Frida in New York. This is not Frida in Mexico. But this is a Frida we know well, right? Posing at the Workers uh, Association under an image of Lenin, um, wearing her reboso, um, uh, her Mexican dress, her hair is all done up. Or sitting with Diego, who's wearing his overalls um, and a tie, I think. It's hard to tell exactly, but um, uh, she's got her own tie, kind of neckerchief, um, and uh, in this case, her reboso is worn more like a workman's jacket uh, than a sort of uh, decorative uh, effect. Um, Frida uh, got married to Diego Rivera in her maid's clothes, right? She is a woman who has um, played a lot of roles but never found a place to be confidently. Um, she's, uh, she's borrowing things from others all the time. And that, that is part of who she is. It's not that she's stealing and that makes her a liar. It's that that's the thing that she does as art, right? She invents herself. She invents the world. That's what makes her such a powerful and rich artist. These are images of herself posing as, you know, a kind of radical. Here, next to Diego, looking like his compatriot, you know, his comrade in arms. Here, looking a little bit more like the, the uh, decorative, um, uh, you know, companion to Diego on the left. Um, but nevertheless, uh, you know, looking very fashionable. But nevertheless, posing on the scaffolding with the paintbrushes right there. The work of art is in process. Um, Trotsky's up there, you know, uh, raising his fist. And, and it's, it's part of a world that, that she emerged into. 
Of course, yes, we know Trotsky uh, did come and stay at the Blue House in Korya Khan, um, there with Andre Breton um, in the, on the left hand side. My left is your left, it's so much easier. Okay, um, and when Diego, you know, the big man who was, of course, the secretary of the Communist Party um, before he had to dismiss himself from the Communist Party. Um, but, you know, he was the political revolutionary. He had been to Paris. He knew the artists. He knew the politicians. He was right there in the center of everything. Frida, of course, in her own way, as we all know, in the center of everything here, standing between uh, Trotsky mm -hmm. and his wife mm -hmm. on the day that they arrived in Mexico. Um, uh, looking, uh, wearing the, um, in this case, you might call it the bandolero rebozo, right? Where she's, <laughs> uh, she's dressed like a real Mexican revolutionary, even though it's a sort of decorative scarf. It's fascinating the kinds of self-presentations that she will she will work through um, over the course of her life and in life as well as in art, right? So she's she's someone who's very much in the middle of this um, uh, Trotskyist um, version of communist milieu. Um, it is a it's a very complicated thing. I've tried to explain to students sometimes about the vicissitudes of Mexican communism in the 1930s. If you want to drive people to surf the web, that's the best thing you can do. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a complicated story. It's something that many, a few people have a great passion for, um, but I don't want to go on and on about it. Just to say that there was a sense of purpose and a sense of collectivity. And I think that's going to come through as I show you some more images. Here, a Tina Madani image of Diego and Frida on May Day, at a May Day parade, um, uh, very much dressed up um, for the workers. Um, uh, and you know, you see that it's a sindico de pintores um, e esqueletores. Um, in other words, this is an artist syndicate, right? Even um, the people who work for the state and the bourgeoisie can join together and become workers. Um, and you know, of course, this is a line that Rivera wrote all of his life, painting for people like Rockefeller, um, and at the same time declaring himself a communist, getting in lots of trouble by combining these things. Um, not only from the capitalists and their art commissioning, but from the communists, um, who indeed, as I said, Diego uh, had to leave the Communist Party um, and was, as you all know, accused of uh, you know, being part of the assassination of Trotsky. So it's a very complicated world that they live in, and it's something that absolutely is fundamental to their existence, right? This is, this is Frida's first year of marriage. This is her out you know, celebrating um, uh, in the way that um, uh, she and Diego would see most fit, right? Um, you know, everybody's, perhaps every couple has their most important holiday. For them, May Day would certainly be that day, right? And you can see she's got her little um, uh, cap. Where is it? There it is. There's her cap there that she's holding, so she's got her hat off, um, but indeed she's wearing it. And here's another picture by Madani on the right. I don't know if you've seen this already today because you had a, a Madani talk. But it's, a, it's up at the May Day Parade there at um, the Zocalo uh, in the center, at the heart of Mexico City. Um, and it is, as you can see, a very big event. Madani's images um, sometimes have the tendency to abstract um, the crowd, to turn um, the humans that make up these parades into universal figures of the worker uh, or the revolution. Um, but in, in such an image, I think, you can still pull out um, a kind of experience um, that's going on in a public space here. Um, it's not a, a, a perfectly defined um, abstract composition. It is a, a documentary photograph, in a way. Um, and it's remarkable as such, because you see the crowds gather, you can see the streetcar here in the front, you see these sort of signs of normal public life, and with that space being taken over, in a sense, by this um, enormous crowd that is converging on um, uh, the plaza. On the left um, is a different uh, kind of uh, crowd. Oops. Um, and it's a popular festival, right? What you're seeing there is another kind of parade and another kind of um, event that um, I think was perhaps just as interesting and just as much a part of Frida's life as um, the, the, the workers' parade on May Day. The official sort of communist um, celebration uh, has one dimension of truth uh, for Frida and Diego's life. And the unofficial, casual work, um, festival um, for the people, the folks, 
what else are we going to call them? Um, the proletariat, I don't think so. Peasants, it doesn't quite work. Um, it, it's really just a, a kind of folk festival, right? And it, it is um, uh, an event that you can tell people are enjoying. Um, also a Madani <laughs> photograph. But notice here, you get faces, right? You get people, you get personalities, people talking to one another, um, dressed in different ways. This fellow with his leg up looking out at us. These people, you know, not really paying attention to the parade. They're in the shade. They're probably having a good time. Um, you get the kind of um, scenes that inspired Rivera's work, right? Here we have um, uh, straw carriers uh, on the left, uh, men with these incredibly large, um, but nevertheless relatively light bundles that they are carrying through the streets, right? This ancient, um, perhaps timeless, um, activity uh, of manual labor, which was very much in evidence, as you can see from an image like this, in uh, the late 1920s and early 1930s in Mexico. This is one of the things that fascinated all those international communists when they flocked to Mexico and discovered this world um, that was right there in front of them. It wasn't some sort of idealized version of um, uh, the peasants that were sort of going to come together um, and create the world revolution. It was, in fact, a, a group of people who were doing things that they had done, um, perhaps for centuries, sort of being suddenly surrounded by a much more modern world. And as parts of um, this city expanded uh, and took over more and more um, uh, villages and turned them into um, uh, uh, courtiers or um, suburbs even, um, it, 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 was a, it was a changing landscape for this kind of activity. It still existed side by side with the streetcars. Um, and yet, um, it seems uh, more and more to be um, a, kind of, um, a kind of world that was passing away, right? And a world that perhaps was something that um, they, uh, they, meaning Frida and Diego, felt a great passion for. Uh, it's quite clear in Diego's work here in our picture, the flower carrier. Um, you see a similarly uh, laden figure, uh, an overwhelming burden upon his back, um, in this case a burden of flowers, hence the irony. But Rivera's um, style, Rivera's um, approach as an artist is to look at this Renaissance tradition. He lived in France, he became a Cubist painter, he hung out with Picasso, he knew all these people. He then went to Italy, um, had this you know, amazing transformative experience where he discovered fresco painting and its significance um, in producing a kind of common visual language for everyone to understand, literate or no. And the potential of realizing that in, in Mexico is something that very much made him the artist that we know today, right? The transformation going from this sort of early modernist uh, sensibility, go to Paris, become cosmopolitan, learn from everybody, um, and then go to Italy, find yourself in the ancient, you know, in the, in the Renaissance traditions, find the greatest artists, and then come back, in a sense, in a way, to Mexico and make that uh, a fusion, create a kind of fusion which could be a kind of national art. Um, an art that thinks on those traditions, that uh, doesn't forget that Cubism exists, but that yet focuses on something which is distinctly Mexican, right? And there are many ways that happens. Um, sometimes it's looking back to um, Mesoamerican cultures and their deities. Um, sometimes it's looking just at scenes like this, the kind that Tina Madani would photograph and that Diego Rivera would paint, right? This, this sense of, of bringing in a kind of popular culture, right? Uh, in America, we have pop art. Right? 30 years before that, you get this as a kind of pop art, right? Popular culture is not a manufactured culture in Mexico. It's a kind of folk culture, right? And this is the, the, the real uh, expansiveness of that model because it allows us to um, find a hero um, uh, from uh, some other world besides the arts or politics, right? And to elevate um, the idea of, of the, the individual uh, folk into a kind of um, universal symbol, right? Um, it is not altogether untimely, um, and they took a very different approach to it than others. Um, Frida was someone who very much identified with um, folk art. 
Um, I'll show you a picture in a minute with her collection of folk art. But this is an image, a juxtaposition of two images. On the right, a photograph by Tina Madani. On the left, a photograph taken in New York by an artist, a photographer named Carl Van Vechten, who um, photographs uh, Frida um, in uh, her self-posed way with a gourd, a painted gourd upon her head. Very much like this woman actually carries her produce home in, right? On the right, we have a woman um, who actually employs that device uh, in regular life. On the left, we have Frida, who is playing up in a theatrical manner her Mexicanness, her Mexicanidad, right? In a New York context. It's kind of like playing the exotic um, when you go to the big city. Um, uh, and, and this is something which she did um, not only uh, in New York, but in Mexico. She did this in relationship to Diego. She did it in her personal life, as well as in her public life. Um, and it is part of who she was, right? It doesn't, um, you know, in a sense, uh, there's a kind of pejorative uh, sense of, of stealing these kinds of uh, cultural traditions, right? Um, Elvis Presley having stole, um, you know, R&B, uh, as it were, and then taking it and making a lot of money with it. I don't think this is quite the same kind of situation. I think that uh, for Frida, it's a source of strength, and it's a source, indeed, of her Mexican identity, um, and to draw on these kinds of um, uh, cultural phenomena, right? these um, perhaps ageless traditions, um, and to continue to update them in a modern way was very important for her. But it also definitely tells us a lot about um, <coughs> society in Mexico City at that time, right? That in a way, her uh, embracing these cultural traditions, embracing the peasants or the folk or whatever um, we want to call them, uh, it is a, in a manner of um, her finding herself, right? Finding indeed what Mexicanidad is, and in a sense of uh, promoting it, right? Taking on uh, the habits of others so that they would be better understood um, in a wider field. Right? At the same time, Frida knows that she is a kind of object of fascination. Um, when she would parade around New York City in her Taiwan, uh, Taiwan Peck outfits, um, and probably not wearing boards on her head, but lots of jewelry, um, she would have children run up to her and say, where's the circus? Where's the circus? Right? There's a sense of being a self-identified exotic. Do you think I'm exotic? I'll show you exotic. Um, you know, the, the necklace can always be bigger. Um, there can always be more embroidery. The hair can always be more uh, resolutely uh, fashioned, right, into a, 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 a complex weave and knot. Um, but what's interesting is that this world lives side by side with her sort of revolutionary aspirations, her identification as a worker, right? So on one hand, we have on the left, uh, Frida and Diego in New York as workers. And on the, on the other hand, we have on the right, Frida and Diego at home um, with their collection of tiles, right? This, all these decorative motifs, um, many of them um, uh, much older than uh, the Mexican state itself, right? And wearing, uh, you know, her folk dress, Diego wearing his Western uh, suit uh, with his Stetson hat. Um, uh, and and it, it just, it, it, sometimes you look at this and you think, they're just playing dress up. And sometimes you look at this and you realize, I, I just think, you know, these people took their sense of self-fashioning so far that they were able to um, develop an ideal of Mexican identity upon, you know, what they wore to work. And, and it seems kind of crazy to say that. Um, you know, you get up, you look in your closet, what am I going to wear today? Um, do I want to dress down? Do I want to dress up? Um, that's about as exciting as I get. Um, will the shirt be white or will it be blue? Um, I have a few purple ones. But really, the, the sense of, of what I can wear and how I will present myself is extremely narrow in range. But what's fascinating to me is that what Diego and Frida were doing, and particularly Frida, because uh, you know, her feminine charm is so much based upon her self-presentation, right? Her ability to manufacture herself in a totally different context every day. That her, her sense of self-presentation was um, a fundamental aspect of her character and showed that she was trying to invent a new kind of tradition, right? She did not want to be a, a happy bourgeois 
um, uh, Mexican, right? Her, um, her identity, uh, well, I'll get into her identity in a second, but um, her identity was complex, but she didn't want to live the life of a privileged woman, and yet she did. She didn't want to look um, uh, like uh, a Mexican peasant, and yet she did, right? There were different things that she embraced, um, and by mixing them together, she, in her person in a way, developed a kind of mexicanidad, a kind of hybrid identity that um, embodied all aspects of her political and social life. And now I'll get into the territory I'm a little bit more familiar with, art. Um, so, you know, this picture uh, from 1934, where's my sheet, I have a cheat sheet, um, is a picture of her, um, her own self, right, her, her identity, my grandparents, my parents, and I. Um, and it is, um, two, 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 here we are, 36, sorry. Um, it's a picture that she traces, she places herself in the courtyard of the Blue House in Koya Khan, right? And holding this ribbon, which is a sort of pictorial emblem, uh, very common in um, a certain kind of Mexican painting. Um, and, uh, and that emblem draws up to her grandparents on either side. On the left side, you have her mother's parents. Um, and uh, she, her mother was an estiza, right? a mixed parentage, um, both European and Indian. Um, and on her father's side, um, this fellow is very mixed parentage, um, uh, born in Germany, Hungarian parents, Jewish parents, um, and mixed, once again, uh, identities. Um, uh, and, you know, a Hungarian immigrant in Germany who then immigrates to Mexico, who marries a woman, um, this is his second wife, actually, um, that has uh, a number of children, um, and Frida's not the first. Um, and here is Frida presenting herself as the result of all these generations uh, of people. And you can see that, you know, costume is very important. Her mother's wedding dress, um, and that's Frida in her belly. I mean, she's cheating here, right? This is, this is not temporally uh, significant. Um, also, you get this wonderful, uh, the, the actual moment of insemination <laughs> included. Uh, you know, you get, you get the whole picture here. But also the Mexican landscape, right? The place is truly important. Um, the kinds of flowers, all rendered in a very direct, um, uh, some would say, um, uh, primitivist, you know, style. But the point being that she is taking all this on. It's her identity, the place, the, the overall place, Mexico, the place itself, the house, which is here enlarged and extravagantly. Um, and these very gen these generations uh, of her family, right? This is, in a sense, her picture of who she is, but it's also a wonderful picture of Mexicanidad, right? Her standing in for um, this uh, identity, which is being forged out of the you know the juxtaposition of a modern um, uh, post-colonial government that is um, trying to find its way um, uh, without becoming like one of those European colonial powers. Um, that, um, you know, colonize them in the first place, right? How to be a modern state that draws from these ancient roots. Um, this is one of the fundamental questions of, of, of Mexican political identity. And indeed, one sees Frida drawing um, as well from those ancient roots, but also showing a very modern um, parentage uh, of mixed descent. Um, I talk about, um, uh, in the article, the way in which she refers to 19th century portraiture when she starts to get going as a painter. This picture on the right painted in San Francisco um, in our collection, um, uh, Frida and Diego Rivera painted for Albert Bender um, as a sort of thank you gift, enters our collection in 1936. Um, Hermana Hildo Bustos on the left, a marriage portrait, right? There's this tradition of uh, Mexican painting in the 19th century that is, on the one hand, not folk art, and on the other hand, does not come out of the academies. There were um, uh, great, cat there, the Academy of San Carlos um, in Mexico was a painter of the academy that was established in the 18th century. So by the time you get to the 20th century, um, or even, even this picture from 1886, that academy had been around for over 100 years by that point. 
But this artist, Bustos, did not go to the academy. He was self-trained. And yet what he does is he adapts his style um, to what is known, right? To what is available as kind of visual information. It's a very simple and direct style. Um, it's a, you know, a photography in a way before the fact, although there was photography by 1886. These people decided to go for the painting. Um, and what you get looks a lot like um, you know, what happened in American painting, um, you know, uh, maybe 50, 100 years before. A very direct, straightforward uh, representation, not trained in any uh, great artistic um, license, doesn't have all the skills um, that uh, an academic training would give you, but nevertheless manages pretty well, right? And that's exactly what Frida takes from this. Um, a sense that uh, she doesn't want to have all the academic stuff uh, uh, thrown down on her. She wants to find her own way. She doesn't expect to be uh, brilliant or great, although she's brilliant in her person, um, but she wants to make it work, right? And she seizes on this particular tradition. Although in, in the case of, of this painting, one of the things that I like to point out when you're in the gallery, and it's actually still even pretty visible here in the reproduction, um, since I know the picture so well, I can point this out. Um, right here, you can see a, a sort of darker spot. Um, and that is where there was a heart that was painted over, right? So that Frida begins with a kind of representational language, um, which is very straightforward and direct, and there's a little banner that Bandera, which, you know, giving the message to Bender, delivered by a dove. And, you know, it's very sentimental um, and direct. And yet, at the same time, at one point, before she finally finishes it off, it says this American boy is never going to go for the big heart bursting out of Diego's, Diego's jacket. Um, uh, she, she has an idea that she can make it totally different. Um, and in a sense, it's a premonition of things to come. But, um, but this is where she starts, right? Really getting her grasp of portraiture and coming to understand it. Here she is with her collection, uh, her and Diego's collection of folk art. You can see on the back, there's an ex-photo painting. Um, on the back of the wall, there's an ex-photo painting there. And then here, I think you can see the bottom of um, one of these uh, early, um, one of these 19th century paintings. It's hard to really make out. You can see a message written down at the bottom there's not much else. There's a Judas figure here. Um, these are the things that have all the fireworks attached to them, um, part of these popular parades. And then all of these other uh, objects made for a variety of uses from courts, which are decorative or musical, um, to objects which are, are surely made for uh, the light and pleasure, uh, candlesticks and whatnot, um, mirrors, but also just, you know, sort of effigy kind of objects. Um, some drawing from uh, kind of mythological, ancient mythological traditions, and others much more fantastic and um, uh, individualized, right? And this is how, when she becomes a mature painter, um, she will position herself, right? Uh, El Sueño, The Dream, um, a painting from 1940, where she places herself hovering on a bed in midair, her bed, this is absolutely Frida's bed, right? The, the, she's, she's sort of, the surrealist thing seems to be taking over because there's these, you know, um, vines that are growing up her uh, sheets and, and um, sort of wrapping themselves around her. But there's the, the Judas figure holding flowers, lying on that above her, right? This idea that um, her dream is, you know, her, well, her drift into the subconscious is to find this other part of herself. And that other part of herself that she finds is this very powerful and strong figure straight from a, a kind of popular parade that we saw early on with the Tina Madani photograph, right? Um, not, uh, the hammer and sickle does not emerge. Leave that for later in life. Um, she, uh, at the very end of her life, um, becomes a much more uh, a painter of uh, communist symbols um, that Stalin and Marx uh, uh, <coughs> play a very large role. But in this particular time, she, it's not that. It's this, it's this figure from popular parades and festivals, right? These, this kind of celebratory image um, uh, from Mexican folk culture, which is absolutely fundamental to her identity. Um, or here, when she shows, when she makes her own ex photo painting, um, uh, the, 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 the picture of um, Dorothy, oh my gosh, I forgot yeah. Thank you, Dorothy Hale. Um, here lying underneath a kind of curtain, 
um, showing her suicide in various stages. Such a picture turned out to be not so good um, for the uh, patron, who didn't like it whatsoever. But um, it's one of those kind of conversations where two people are speaking two different languages. I want a memorial portrait, for instance. Memorial, ex voto, right? You want to, you know, this divine intervention. Um, and here, you know, an ex voto portrait made actually, I think, uh, the Dorothy Hale is 37. This ex voto is made in 1936, right? So this is actually a straight, you know, uh, contemporary image, um, the kind of thing that she <coughs> had, off, had off her wall, um, uh, that she derives, um, you know, tr she derives her work from, in some sense, this tradition. Very stripped down, very bare, very simple kind of painting. Um, Grandma Moses, right? This is something we all recognize in our own country. Very much present um, in Mexico as well. Um, but don't forget um, that uh, Frida's dad uh, was a photographer. Um, there he is, uh, Guillermo Calo, um, emigrated from Germany. And uh, as a photographer, one of his tasks was to photograph colonial churches. Um, so this picture from 1905, um, uh, the, the Catedral de Mexico, um, is an image that is, you know, I, I, it's hard to find Guillermo photographs. Uh, Guillermo Calo photographs, there's not a whole lot of them. You have to go to the book and take images out of the book. But in a sense, this is his project, right? Kind of recuperation of colonial, uh, uh, Spanish colonial history um, uh, that uh, is everywhere throughout Mexico. Octavio Paz says, um, uh, we buried our colonial history during the revolution, but we buried it in our own backyard. Um, this picture from just before the revolution, when uh, Guillermo Calo was doing this uh, circuit um, of Mexico and taking pictures of all these wonderful uh, colonial churches. Remember that Frida, as a young girl, actually was um, his, photo his, his assistant um, and traveled if she didn't travel with him, she at least helped him develop the film. So this is the kind of image that she would have been very familiar with. So now, you know, looking back at this, um, you can see Dorothy Hale in a slightly different light um, when we compare her here to anonymous picture of Brother Juan Diaz and Brother Jose Moreno in the last quarter of the 18th century. Um, these fellows were um, uh, friars who were victim, uh, victims of a, an Indian massacre. They were sent up to northern Mexico, then uh, Texas, um, and now Texas, and uh, they were they were brutally, you know, murdered by uh, this group of uh, Native Americans. They were um, given this kind of um, very serious retablo treatment, right? Where um, the message, as you can see at the bottom, is written in great detail, the entire history of the event. The episode itself is a bit sketchy out there in the background, but the figures are rendered in a sort of grandiose style. Um, but the blood is, is not sparingly used, right? It is very vivid, and that sense of, of uh, sacrifice is, is absolutely the raison d'etre of this kind of painting. Um, uh, these uh, fellows have made a great sacrifice um, for the glory of God, and God will, of course, will act, right? Um, so if you look at Dorothy Hale in the light of this picture, it's perhaps um, another end of the ex voto tradition that Frida aspires to with this painting. Not so much the raw, unskilled labor um, of the ex voto artist of 1936, but perhaps more the skilled and detailed um, uh, maneuvering of this anonymous retablo artist of the late 18th century, someone who has studied painting, if not in an academy, but will provide a kind of image that unifies and that brings people together, right? I'm not sure that, um, that Frida's image is intended to do the same thing, right? But the way in which the blood flows so freely, the way in which the message is spelled out across the bottom of the canvas, and the means in which she uh, chose to realize this, right? The scene behind um, resulting in the, in the death in the foreground, right? Very much similar to what's going on pictorially um, uh, in uh, the double portrait. Another tradition that she drew from um, was uh, right here, uh, a little bit closer in time for her. Um, it's, you know, frankly, it's, you know, definitely one of the most important um, traditions in Mexico at the time. Jorge Posada um, was a printmaker and um, published many um, different kinds of 
illustrations in many different kinds of journals, um, and ran a small press, um, was, was committed to um, leftist ideals, and really um, created a wide array of work over the course of his life. It's kind of unfair to just give him one image, um, which is a bit sensational on the left, um, but it does communicate, I think, some of the, some of the raw power that um, a kind of folk image translated into mass culture could produce, right? Um, to uh, give us an image which is, on one hand, um, powered by a kind of uh, a folk tradition in Mexico, and on the other hand, powered by a sort of knowledge of um, the techniques and the mastery of the processes that uh, Daumier, for example, another leftist printmaker in France, had done a generation before Poisson. Um, he's really translating something and creating his own visual language. I put this next to um, Frida Kahlo's um, A Few Small Nips um, to demonstrate how she also would play off of history and turn it into something entirely different, right? It's a, it, Posada is, a, is an enormously important modernist precedent for Frida Kahlo's work um, in the sense that he provided a kind of um, an, an alternative to either um, the folk tradition or the highly educated academic tradition, uh, and gave it a kind of Mexican life, right? Really brought it, um, really brought it a kind of vividness and directness, which was um, particularly Mexican and particularly his, right? Just as Frida, when she's horrified by the story of a man who brutally murdered his girlfriend, um, and then going to court uh, is asked about it, and says, oh, what, I gave her a few small nips. Um, obviously, he hasn't given her a few small nips. It's rather a, it's rather a bloody affair. Um, and uh, I cut it from the presentation at the last minute. But there is a wonderful picture that I have with Frida sitting under this painting, and there's a knife sticking out of the frame. She hasn't actually painted the red on the frame yet. But there is a, a kind of enacting of the, uh, the violence upon the object itself. Um, and that's, of course, what makes Frida's art different and more vivid, um, a real kind of power in that it, it's not just you know, giving it kind of spectacularization of a, of a contemporary event. She's making it personal, really. It's really about her. It's about her pain. It's about her suffering and the way in which she feels like she's been cut up, cut open um, by Diego. Um, this is painted around the time that he sleeps with her sister. Uh, she to say, one of the few pictures she completed that year and full of a lot of even though it does seem to be a political um, Here, uh, we look at Frida in her, with her necklace of thorns, uh, next to a painting by Henri Rousseau. Um, it's a point I already made in the article, and you've read it, so I'm not going to make it too much more, but just to say how funny um, that Frida would be drawing from this source, um, but that Henri Rousseau is a self-conscious outsider. He's someone who's not seen to be an avant garde Picasso and Apollinaire, um, Leger, these people love him, but not because they see him as one of them, and not because he's like Cezanne, who is this important artistic predecessor. They love him because he is self-consciously not that. He's not going to play that artistic game. He's not embedded in a kind of series of stories about what art is or could be. He just makes the kinds of pictures that make you feel different, because you can't First of all, the imagery helps you to travel. But secondly, you can't place it. It's not quite right. It's not this or that, right? It doesn't disclose fully its sources. It rather invents a kind of world in of itself. And I think that Frida uh, was very gifted at doing that, right? And then, you know, borrowing sources from everywhere, she's able to achieve her own kind of fusion. Um, speaking of Mexicanidad, here she is. My dressings there about her time in New York. Um, on the left, Tina Madani, photograph of a Tehuantec woman um, wearing the exact same outfit, more or less. Um, uh, this is a, a modernist composition, really, devoted, um, it's a collage. Uh, I didn't ever know it was a collage until I saw it in the flesh. Uh, I always thought those things at the bottom were, you know, sort of details. But in fact, they're cut out from magazines and newspapers, very much the same way that Dada collages were made. I show you Hannah Hawk on the left, cut with a kitchen knife, and you see that she copied, in a way, um, the way in which the crowds were presented and folded in uh, to the image itself, right? Um, what's funny is that the, the crowds, go back a minute, are 
part of this huge concoction of the modern city, right? The modern city, which is, in this sense, um, a, a distant place for her. Uh, her dress hangs there between a trophy and a toilet bowl, right? Uh, that's what she thinks about American culture. Um, uh, there, there's, a, there's a sense of disidentification with it. And yet, the dress itself is her source of identification. So on the one hand, she runs, um, uh, what, is it, what do they call it? Um, she uh, flees with the foxes and runs with the hounds or something. She's, she's very much playing both sides of the equation. On one hand, she's very interested in modern art. She's willing to make art that's entirely modern, using collage um, and elements from modern newspapers. And on the other, on the other side, she's identifying with a kind of pre-modern uh, Mexican culture as a source of strength and identity. So um, it's hard to pull apart all the references, right? Mae West, for example, who's on the poster on the left, the poster's peeling off. It's a sense of the consumer culture, you know, uh, which just makes things so rapidly that it doesn't even worry uh, how long they last. And yet Mae West would have been a figure that I think would have been significant for her because she was a woman um, who was very much uh, of her own mind and uh, made a room for herself in a society which was fundamentally sexist and derived, you know, most of its uh, attention on men and used women in a particular way. Mae West created an identity for herself there. Frida Kahlo um, certainly created the same kind of identity, um, or, uh, also created an identity for herself within her own context. Um, here, a, a picture that I used in the article, um, where Frida actually borrows the coral necklace and the pink dress um, uh, to pose herself on the border um, of Mexico and the United States. She sees herself as a kind of um, uh, a person who doesn't find home in one or the other. On one hand, you have the roots, um, all these uh, indigenous plants, um, uh, Mesoamerican uh, uh, pottery figures, um, the, the temple, and then the, uh, the Judas head, the sort of popular culture, um, sitting there uh, on its side. On the other hand, you have America, the Ford plant, uh, the steam, uh, the smoke belching out, the, uh, the flag emerging from that, the lights, the sounds. And Frida, uh, step, stepping there in the middle, disidentifying herself as Carmen Rivera, um, even though we all know it's Frida Kahlo. Carmen, um, who is this lady? Uh, she's sort of a generic Mexican <coughs> figure, I think, Rivera being the wife. But this is, of course, the dress that she actually wore. She pictured herself in a dress that was hers. It's Miss Ansel Adams' photograph uh, of uh, the moment of Diego and Frida arriving. You can see that she's actually wearing the dress with the three tiers of lace, right? That pink dress might be the pink dress um, of the uh, 19th century portrait, um, but uh, it is also the pink dress of her own um, of her own arrival in the United States, right? This is the, the role she plays in the dress she wears. Um, so in as much as it's kind of symbolic and allegorical image, it's also one which is personal about the um, a coral necklace, right? Um, uh, it's exactly a coral necklace, right? Uh, um, that was uh, Estrada before. Um, this is uh, Bustos, right? Um, but the coral necklaces um, that are all the fashion in the 19th century continue to be part of life in the 20th. Um, here she's putting Jean White, um, a woman who she didn't think all that much of, um, that she met in San Francisco. Um, in, in this coral necklace as a way of, I think, trying to spruce up her looks. Um, she thought that, that uh, gringos looked uh, a little bit like um, dough balls, I think. <laughs> um, or here in Los Dos Fridas, right, the, the, perhaps her greatest and most important picture, um, certainly one of the largest. This made at the year after, the year during the time of her divorce with, with uh, Diego. Um, where she wears, uh, is supposedly the, the Frida that Diego loves, the Tehuan, you know, the Tehuantec outfit on the right, on the left, the, the, the Frida that Diego no longer loves um, in her mother's wedding gown, right? Um, trying to stop the bleeding. Um, with Diego, I guess it must have been very difficult. Um, but, you know, very much posing herself with herself, creating a kind of identity, um, a, a dual identity showing the kind of conflictedness of her search for self within this very international context, trying to be on one hand the wife and on the other hand 
the, the artist, right, the really creative figure who invented the world of her own, even though what was so obvious is that her husband was the famous artist. Um, starting to get uh, a career of her own was something that happened right after this picture was made, right, that she started, yeah, she had the show in New York when this picture was made, in Paris the next year, met Picasso, gives her the earrings and all that. Um, says uh, in a letter to Diego Rivera, um, I saw this incredible picture by your wife. She could make a head better than you or I. Um, a backhanded compliment, I think you call that. Um, <laughs> where you compliment someone's wife and insult them, right? Um, but the, her career would take off. But at the same time, you can see her struggling with this, and struggling with the idea of seeing herself apart from this. I think partially because she's, she's part of this much larger narrative about a uh, formation of identity. Her identity is both personal and political. It is both about herself and about the wider world that she lives in, right? And so, in a sense, the picture of Los Dos Fridas becomes another kind of imitato Christian, right? A way of identifying with um, this, um, uh, this great past culture, right? This colonial um, identity that had so suppressed Mexicans for so many years is nevertheless a source of strength and the opportunity um, of redemption is always there. And I think that's one of the things that, um, as an outsider, someone who, who um, comes to this work uh, as an art historian, I find constantly fascinating about, um, about Frida's work is that in reiterating the topos of colonial painting, she can um, nevertheless seize on that moment that is redemptive, right? She can transform it into something else. And I think that is absolutely true, whether you're talking about Frida the Communist, Frida the, uh, uh, the, who identifies with the, the people, um, the folks, um, or Frida who is uh, fascinated um, as, an art, uh, as an artist with these prior traditions, right? The idea of um, the heart, right? The, um, what is it called here? The Sacred Heart of Jesus with St. Ignatius of Loyola and St. Louis Gonzaga, right? Um, it is a kind of a redemptive possibility that the past holds. No matter which past it is, it is something that can allow you to identify and to make new uh, a, a kind of a source of, to make new a, a, a source of national strength. Right? Um, you can both strengthen yourself and strengthen your um, national identity. Through this. Um, and once again, another um, another colonial. A picture where Frida, who in the broken column seems to be exposing herself about as much as anyone could possibly expose herself. But you look at this image um, by Juan Patricio Molete Ruiz, right? Um, oh, I'm sorry. No, nope, this is a, an anonymous 17th century painting. Um, she, I don't, my cheat sheet is just moving. Um, and you look at this image and you say, this is an incredible. Um, this is an incredible way of looking in, right? Of looking into the body and, and breaking down the, the line between the material, the spiritual, and the physical, right? Um, Frida is doing something like that, right? And, and the, the analyses of her broken column picture, which, you know, talk about her back, and that's absolutely the case, right? Or her pain um, from Diego is absolutely, both of these are absolutely true. There's no shortage of pain in her life. Her ability to deal with it in such a straight, even-handed, direct way is an incredible, powerful, artistic statement, right? But it is not without precedent. There are these ideas, right, of religious and spiritual uh, overcoming, which were played out in visceral pictorial terms throughout the colonial period. And it is the kind of reckoning with this material um, that allows Frida to be a different kind of spiritual symbol, right? To at, at one time embrace the, uh, the spiritual traditions of the past, but to um, bring herself up into a kind of spiritual tradition of the present, right? And to see herself um, as, a, as an emblem, as well as a person and an artist. Um, you know, and, and no better, I think, demonstration than this a very extravagant Via Pondo picture um, in relationship to um, a Frida Kahlo painting. Um, now, showing you the direct comparison, um, the lactation of St. Dominic 
uh, or Santo Domingo, we should say, um, and the lactation of Frida Kahlo, right? And as St. Dominic becomes the blood brother of Christ by drinking from that breast, so does she become the blood sister of the Mesoamericans by drinking from that breast, right? Um, this kind of um, uh, comparison of back and forth, um, it's not intended as a way of sealing off her work or of sort of explaining it, but to add some more dimension to it. Because I think when you think of Frida's work um, solely in relationship to um, popular culture in Mexico, um, to uh, U.S. Uh, ideas of modernism, um, and international ideas of communism, um, or even you know, in relationship solely to Mesoamerican religious traditions, if you, if you forget the history and the way in which she's um, navigating that history in order to give birth to a new historical moment, right? You, uh, you miss out on something that Frida has achieved. And it, it seems to me that um, one of her uh, greatest abilities is to weave together the traditions and to fashion herself as a totally new and completely invented figure from a wide array of, of historical, um, pictorial, and religious traditions. Uh, I'm almost out of time, but I would be happy to answer questions. <coughs> painting a few little nips. Do you know the date of the article that was published in Posada's uh, periodical? That's a lot earlier. The Posada is, uh, Posada dies in, is it 12, I think? So that is a sort of very, I think that's just around the turn of the century. Um, Do we really think that Frida saw it? I'm leading up to something, that's why I'm asking. Well, it's 1905. She was born in 1907. So. I think that Posada was sort of the grandfather of Mexican modernism. Right. So I think that it, it's, with all of his work, it's possible. But on the other, on the other side, he produced broadsheets. So everything was very temporary. And the fact that we even have any of this stuff to look at anymore is, is, um, is quite shocking. Well, Thanks to librarians. <laughs> <laughs> well, let, me, let me elaborate a little bit. We have in our collection an oral interview that Emmy Lou Packard conducted of Pele de Lac mm -hmm. in the 80s. Mm -hmm. And Pele recounted a story where in 1930-31, when Diego and Frida were in San Francisco, one night Diego was painting. Frida was in the building at 716 Montgomery Street with Arnold and Lucille Blanche and maybe a couple other artists. And they had a game that they played that was based on doodles. Mm -hmm. and let's say Frida would start a doodle with a head, pass it to Pele, she would do something mm -hmm. usually vulgar, and it would go around the table, and it could either get pornographic or it could get quite gruesome. Right. And what evolved out of that evening of doodle was based, what Paley said, was the basis for a few little nips, hmm. which then was painted when in 35, I think. Yeah, no, that's actually quite interesting. I mean, I think that the, um, you know, the whole, uh, that's called exquisite corpse, right, when you do that. When oh, you I didn't know what it was called. That's Say a, it again. exquisite corpse. Yes. Ah. So it's a, it's a, it's, um, Exquisite Corpse, it's a very funny name, isn't it? Um, but it was, uh, I think, titled that by the Surrealists. Um, they used to do this in Paris in the 20s, and I'm not sure if there's a direct connection there or if it's somehow, you know, how that how that tradition got passed. Breton, Breton. Uh-huh. But he wasn't in Mexico it, until much later, so. Well, but uh, he was very, he was a participant in right. very much in, in right. this. Right. Well, and it could have been Wolfgang Pollen, who was here um, uh, via New Mexico a little bit earlier. I mean, it, it's all it's all in the air. But the exquisite corpse was basically a way of using the self-conscious to formulate an image. The idea being that um, it wouldn't be some particular person's subconscious, but everybody's collective subconscious, because you just draw a little bit and then pass it on and nobody gets yes. to see. Um, but, uh, but the composition um, going that way, I mean, that's very, it's a very compelling, that's a very compelling um, uh, Well, if you come visit the Rivera collection, I'll share it with you. Okay. <laughs> also, do you know the publication Coast, Coast Magazine? Mm -hmm. it was, this was WPA writers through the right. 30s and 40s. And one of the issues has, I think, two pages devoted to now this exquisite corpse, right. or these exquisite corpses, <laughs> that were created by a whole cadre of local WPA artists. Huh. They're very amusing. They're kind of wild, fanciful, well, cartoon, whatever. Right, right. Yeah. Very well, it's interesting. interesting what artists do when they're not trying to be serious. <laughs> <laughs> and how that relates.
relates to what artists do when they are trying to be serious. Um, yeah. Yes? What was Frida Kahlo's religious tradition? She, she immigrated, what was her religious background? Well, her mother was a practicing Catholic, but she was not, um, you know, she was not inculcated into those values fully, I don't think. I think her father wasn't really um, very interested in that. And I think that Frida, uh, who was a very independent person, was not really following that um, religious tradition. It's certainly something that she knew um, uh, personally, but it's not something that she had. So she, did, she was not a church going as a child or anything like that? I, I don't know about all the details. I'm sure there are people that know that. But it is a photograph for a communion dress. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I think, that, I think that it's important in a sense that there is a kind of religious backbone, a religious tradition that was the backbone of her life and a sort of series of rituals uh, that she engaged in that would have led her in, in this direction, um, just if not anything else by being around those churches that had those paintings, um, because that, that the San Domingo picture was in the cathedral of San Domingo, which was not the most, but the second most, second largest cathedral in Mexico City. So all this access would have been there. Um, and the, that um, ritualistic practice, right, the sort of stages of life and how you mark those. Although with her wedding, she didn't get married in church. <laughs> well, you couldn't uh, go to school and avoid uh, being with people who are religious, but you have to look at her collection of ex photos. Oh yeah, absolutely. I and that's a that, and that that's a that's a religious, but also a kind of pictorial tradition as well. Yeah, exactly, and extremely. Well, I brought this to put up on the table for people to look at, and uh, it's uh, it exists, I believe, in English also. And, uh, oh yeah. Cool. Uh, because it's uh, a trunk was found in the mm -hmm. house. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. No, and that, I think that's a, a kind of, you know, as much as there are so many reasons to love Frida, and there are so many interesting stories to weave from her life, but I think that um, one of the things as an art historian that I find interesting about Frida is that people are so willing to believe the stories and so uninterested in trying to get to the bottom of some of them. Um, and it's sort of, when I heard, when I first started working on the show, that there was a trunk and a number of letters discovered in, um, in a closet in Frida's house, um, I couldn't understand how there could have been an undiscovered closet in Frida's house. <laughs> I mean, she died so many years ago, you know, and, uh, and here's an artist of such intense veneration and focus, and how could they have not known? I guess they knocked down a wall, and well, they found behind that wall a friend of mine wrote this book, and apparently this was just a moldy old trunk. It was like stuck in the, uh, there was a lot of restoration involved uh, in, uh, in finally getting this together because it was just a moldy old, dusty, very dusty uh, uh, place where stuff was stored and people just didn't look at it. And there's it. also a lot of, I mean, Frida's become such a famous figure that there's also a ton of things Around. This is something that happens when you work at a museum and you work on a show like this. Everybody and their brother calls you with their Frida something or other. And uh, sometimes it's real and it's because she lived here for a while and she knew people that not everything got donated to some place or other, but, um, but a lot of times it's not. And so, you know, as with the recent book, um, uh, the supposed diaries of Frida and all that. Um, <laughs> yeah. person actually used to work on You know, you have to be suspicious a little bit of new discoveries, but there, there is a lot of other stuff that just hasn't been really looked into. It's fascinating. Yeah. Um, the, you know, Frida did have a very interesting life. by the established art community here in the Bay Area. There's been very little, uh, I think, recognition of that community. And why do you think that is so? Well, it's very interesting. Um, I think it's about modernism and, and what we see modernism to be. 
and that in this particular period, um, the 30s, when, when Rivera was here, he was, you know, the most famous artist in the Western Hemisphere. And, um, and that was what modernism was. The WPA uh, elevated that, expanded it, and, and, and made it much more part of everyday life um, in the United States. Um, you know, I think he trained many people while he was here, and, and, and the, you know, the, that information drifted into many different sectors. But I also think that when World War II came, and the American um, school, or the New York school, uh, came into existence with abstract painting, the WPA material um, was uh, kind of got shuffled off. And in fact, many artists who painted it when they started stopped, got rid of those old things. David Park took his stuff to the dumpster in Berkeley, and all of his figurative art, just get rid of it. Um, so there's a sense of, of just sort of neglecting that period of history, and you know, that, uh, what do they say, history is written by the victors, right? And in this case, the victory was that of abstract art. But I think that um, over time, this period has become more interesting. Um, obviously, it's very, very essential for a, a sense of Mexican art history, but in terms of understanding the way um, American art falls into a kind of hemispheric domain, right? When we think about you know, sort of um, America's art instead of American art, um, then we start to see it in a different light and we start to see different kinds of relationships. And, you know, there are other abstract traditions that were neglected then, too, from the 20s and 30s that are now, um, uh, you know, starting to become more visible. Um, but it is, it is, I think, because, it, because of this history and the way in which it's played out, and I can see that, um, you know, those, those lines have come to the end abstract painting and kind of triumphalism around the American scene and the American school. Um, and so I think that there'll be more opportunities to look more at the, the WPA period of the future. Yes? I understand that Madonna's a major fan of Peter Koppel, who's built a major collection. <laughs> um, is, there available? is this collection available for viewing, or is this kind of been locked away? Madonna would not lend to our show. I think <laughs> she's got, I think she, she has two paintings. I mean, there's only 47 or something, right? There's so few Frida Kahlo paintings that are extant. And every once in a while, anyway, it gets added. But um, the, you know, the, um, actually her work is more like 70 works, I'm sorry. But the, the, the number of pictures that she created in her lifetime is so small um, that nobody can get very many of them, even somebody as rich as Madonna. So um, Madonna's pictures were loaned to the Tate. And the only way you can tell which ones are Madonna's is because they weren't loaned to any other shows. Because <laughs> there was then another, so the Tate did their show, and then the next year, the Mexico did their 100th anniversary of Frida shows. And then Mexico City, and then the Walker show, which became the SF Mama show, was also celebrated. So three shows in quick succession, and Madonna's were in the first one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Maybe it was a question. Yeah. Could Frida classify herself as um, an artist, a painter? Uh, in other words, she said that uh, she wasn't actually a surrealist. Mm -hmm. Did she actually classify herself as an artist? Put I herself think into a category. I think that Frida, Frida was the kind of person who didn't tend to make positive identifications. In other words, she wouldn't say, I'm a, she would say, I'm not a, <laughs> right? And, and I think that for her, it's also hard, in, in the same way that, you know, um, artist James can be sort of narrow about figurative painting versus abstract painting. Uh, they can be narrow about, like, painting is art, and, and that other stuff she was doing was her life. That's not art. And on the other hand, you could take a whole other view of that as kind of performing this um, Mexican identity as part of her art, right? Because always you get these photographs of her and these paintings of her where she's kind of invested in um, performing and playing out an identity with these multiple um, sources, right? And her hybridity, the hybridity that she represents as herself, her identity, um, and, and that sort of way in which that crosses over with Mexican, that he kind of died, is a kind of um, 
historical performance, if you will, that, that I think has the kinds of qualities that people identify with and appreciate as art. Um, certainly there are more fans of Frida, and it's, yes, her paintings are incredible, and when you see them, they are actually as vivid as, as, um, as they look, um, you know, more so. But the, the, the reality is that there are many of the greatest things she did are now lost, right? And we can't, like, when I saw that picture for the first time of the knife stuck in the frame, I was like, she did that. That's, that's something she did, and then she just left it there. And it just, it, it turns up in a couple of different photographs, you know, she just stabs the frame of the painting. That's a kind of radical act. It's not a painting. It's not something you can preserve. You can only find that in a photograph. But it's something that, who would have done that? You know, who would have stabbed their own painting? <laughs> That's incredible. <laughs> All right, I think, I think I'm over time for questions, but I'm happy to talk to you after. Um, <laughs>